Thank you for coming back after lunch. Um, my name is Dave Spencer, uh, I'm the author of Gateway, and in this session we're looking at life skills for teenagers. Just to check whether this talk is relevant for you, could you put your hand up if you teach teenagers at the moment? Excellent, good. Can you put your hand up if you have taught te teenagers at any moment in the past? Excellent, good. And can you put your hand up if at any stage of your life you have been a teenager? <laughs> Right, that's most of you. Some of you are having trouble remembering there, but um, if you can remember being a teenager, can you remember ever saying anything like this when you were a teenager? Yeah, what I do, what we learn at school is a waste of time. It has nothing to do with life after school. Do you think that's a fair comment when you were a teenager? Um, I think if I think back at being a teenager, a lot of things we did maybe indirectly in the future have been useful, but a lot of them did not seem useful at the time. Um, and maybe this se seems like a thing of the past, uh, but here's an interesting quotation from a very recent book, Educating Ruby, which is definitely worth reading, what our children really need to learn. And this is from 2015. And they ask this question, which I think is a valid question. Uh, if you're not a teacher, when was the last time you needed in your real life to solve a quadratic equation? Or recall without recourse to your iPad the capital city of Mongolia? Or explain the difference between a terminal and a medial moraine? Or a brief and a minim? And I think this is saying this question is like, are these things that often our heads were filled with this information, was it useful in any particular way in the future? Um, Meanwhile, of course, uh, there have been lots of studies about employability. This is one from uh, a national, I think it's uh, National Employment Services, and they asked employers if students, teenage students, were prepared for the world of work. And you can see that 16-year-olds, 29, almost 30% of all teenagers at 16 were considered not ready for the world of work. Okay. Um, I'll talk about employability from time to time in this session, so I'll come back to that idea. But there was certainly worry, I think, on the part of governments and on the part of the British government of whether school is preparing students for life after school. Um, and that's why they invented this subject, PSHE education, okay, which began in the 1990s. Uh, that stands then for personal, social, health, and economic. And the idea was, as it says here, to help students with the real issues that they need to know about in life as they grow up. Um, and it says that they are central, integral to young people's well-being. Um, now, sometimes it's easy to say what is not useful, but it's more difficult to say what is useful. The areas that they identified were these, amongst others, okay? But these were the main areas. And I think, obviously, um, they all sort of seem to make sense to me. Nutrition, nutrition and physical activity, this idea that, of course, today's teenagers maybe are more obese, they're eating badly, they're eating the wrong food, they're not getting enough exercise because they're in front of a screen all the time. Things like relationships between uh, students and their families, between students and their friends, between students and classmates. The idea of stress and confidence, which is maybe nowadays uh, affecting a lot of teenagers, the idea that there's more competition, so they need to think about emotional health. Safety, so physical safety, uh, bullying, etc. And then work-related learning and personal finance, which was added on later. The fact that students, particularly UK university students, suddenly they're studying at university, but they don't know how to look after their money, and they become increasingly in debt. Meanwhile, I think what's interesting is that the European Commission for Education and Training sort of came to the same conclusions as the UK, so they do have these things that they identified as key competences. Um, and that includes things like uh, the things, again, that they say will help students find personal fulfillment, which is very similar to the expression used in the UK, and later in life, find work, take part in society. So the aims and the conclusions seem to be similar. Uh, and the key competences that they discovered were things like 
communication in your mother tongue, but then importantly, foreign languages, which I've underlined, digital skills, literacy and basic skills and maths and science. Those are the things that any teenage student should know before they finish school. And the good news, of course, for English teachers is that according to that, English is a life skill. English is a key competence. It's something that all of our students should know to be able to function in the 21st century. They also, the European Commission, they also identified these things they call horizontal skills. And they're called horizontal, obviously, because they go across the curriculum. So the idea is that all subjects should include things like learning to learn, social and civic responsibility, initiative, entrepreneurship, cultural awareness, and creativity. And as soon as I sort of read this list as a teacher of English to teenagers, I sort of think that a lot of these things are things that we can easily incorporate into our lessons and that we probably do incorporate. Um, because basically, if we think of things like learning to learn, a good course book will include things like learning skills, study skills, which are useful for English, but not just for English. So they can use them in other subjects. They can use them at university, in life after school. Um, simple things like cultural awareness. I think a key part of teaching a foreign language is actually aiding young people to be culturally aware of other people, other languages, other ideas. And creativity, which I would say is something that as English teachers, we are used to incorporating into all of our lessons. So um, again, there's good news is that English is a life skill and English is also a good medium for including these skills. I think if I was a history teacher, I might find it difficult to incorporate some of those things into my classes. But an English teacher can, because basically I think we can use them as texts. So we can use them for reading and listening texts, and we can use them as the basis for oral and written work. Um, and the important thing here, I think, is that basically life skills maybe for teenagers is actually helping us to prepare our lessons because it's giving good material that is actually relevant to our students to incorporate into lessons. And I've sort of expressed it in this way. It's a bit like the Miley Cyrus factor versus teaching something like infographics. In other words, when I trained and um, when I started teaching teenagers, I used to spend a long time doing popular culture with my teenagers until I realized that if I do One Direction with my class, half of the class love One Direction and the other half hate One Direction, which means that it makes it a difficult lesson for me to give. The students who love One Direction know everything they need to know about One Direction, so there's nothing I can teach them. And at the end of the day, maybe as a teacher of teenagers, my duty is not to be teaching just popular culture, but to be teaching useful things that students can then incorporate into their lives. And that's why sort of in Gateway then, second edition, the main areas that I sort of, that we decided to incorporate are these, which I think all sort of generally, they look a little bit similar to the PSHE education, also similarities with the European Commission, but we've got things like personal well-being, physical well-being, um, the world around you, so the environment, it's thinking about the environment, looking after the environment, uh, things like academic skills, so that students are learning to be good students, today and also when they go off to university where they will have less help and guidance from their teachers. Um, and also things like numeracy, which we saw with the infographics, but is maybe less important in general than the other topics. Money and finance. And the last thing is actually art and culture, which is sometimes not included maybe as a life skill. But I personally think um, if we remember the PSHE Education and European Commission, it mentioned personal fulfillment and personal well-being. And I think employability is very important, but also our jobs as teachers of teenagers is to help teenagers be happy and have a full life. And I would say the same way as sport is important. Maybe reading is important, literature is important, appreciating art is also important. So not just work, but other things too. Now, if you can sort of try and remember those areas for a second, if you can sort of like have a, a little uh, go at memorizing them, because I've got a few sort of quiz questions for you now. Um, and what I'm going to do, I'm going to give you a question, and I want you to take a wild guess at the answer, but then also tell me what area of life skill do you think the question refers to, okay? So the first question, everybody knows bog off, yeah? Buy one, get one free. 
What percentage of people throw away food they buy with a buy one, get one free offer? They're very common in the UK, aren't they, in particular in supermarkets, yeah? So you buy one bottle of Coke and they, they force you to take another bottle, really. Um, how much, what percentage do you think of that food or drink is actually thrown away later? Have a wild guess. 60, 60 70. It's actually not that high, but it's still high when you think 30%. 30% is a lot of food. When you think of other countries where food is sort of like lacking, where people are actually, even in Western Europe, people have got a lack of food, it seems amazing that that could happen. What area of life is this looking at from the areas that I had before? Maybe also finance? Yeah, okay, so I sort of like categorized it with money and finance. Um, and that's then sort of looking at things like buy one, get one free. Teenagers are the typical group of the population that are targeted most by companies to sell products. And I think that giving students the knowledge of sort of what techniques companies, advertisers use to sort of trick them to buy things. Um, so things like drip pricing, yeah? You, everybody know what drip pricing is? So drip pricing is when they say that it's like 35 pounds, but as you're buying it, suddenly there's an extra charge for this, there's an extra charge for that, there's an extra charge for something else. Um, I'm going to say maybe Ryanair, for example, um, although I shouldn't. But if you imagine then, you know, you sort of, you buy uh, your flight, but then you have to pay extra money for a seat. Okay, so things like that. So that's sort of drip pricing. Uh, baiting, of course, which is the idea that it maybe says 50% sale, but when you look closely, it says up to 50%. And then inside the shop, in fact, nearly everything is 10%, 20%, and not 50%. Now, I personally think teenagers are at a great age to be made aware of things like this, because they are a little bit savvy, they do know a little bit, they like shopping, but they've never thought about these things, okay? So this would be a typical area that we can get students to think about, to sort of just have an idea, to think critically in that sense about, you know, what are they trying to do when they advertise these products to us, okay? Next quiz question, how many minutes of moderate sport or physical exercise does the World Health Organization recommend teenagers to do, minimum? 15, 1, 5? Yeah, anybody more than that? Half an hour maybe? Okay, well you're going to be a little bit surprised by this one then because it's actually 60 minutes, okay? A day. Uh, one thing, it does say moderate, okay? So that actually even includes things like walking. So if you walk to school, that would count as your part of your uh, 60 minutes. Um, what area of life are we looking at, obviously? Health, physical well-being, okay? Now, uh, again, what we can do is get students, first of all, thinking about different types of exercise, so things like aerobic exercise, stamina, flexibility, thinking about then what they do in their typical day, and in English, giving them a life task where they actually prepare a timetable and decide, okay, right now, what sport do I do usually on Mondays? What do I do on Tuesdays? What do I do each day of the week? Then they examine that and think, okay, does that come to 60 minutes, yes or no? And then working, for example, in pairs, they sort of decide together, what could they do to get to their 60 minutes per day? Um, one other thing I think about life skills that it's good is that it gives us the opportunity for working with our colleagues in other subjects. So in this case, why not work with a PE teacher? Okay, and go across, you know, across the curriculum, working with other departments, and you could do something together where the PE teacher and you, the English teacher, work together to prepare this fitness diary. Um, and again, you know, that's useful. So we're talking about something that's useful for their lives today, tomorrow, for the rest of their lives. Next question, okay, so you all know about standby power, so we've got our television plugged in. It's not actually on, but it is plugged in and it's using electricity. Any idea how many millions of pounds are wasted this way, with televisions being on standby power? A wild guess. Wild, wild. I was in Mexico last week, somebody said 80 pounds, okay, but it's actually, you know, we are talking about millions here. How many pounds? How many millions of pounds? It's actually 190 million, okay? Which is again a stunning amount of money to be wasted on nothing at all. It's just actually having it plugged in is a waste of money. Um, that's obviously the area of life and the world around you, the environment, thinking about protecting the environment. Um, and you know, this idea that 
ecology, saving the planet, well, to save the planet, begin at home. And it is amazing how many things you can do just at home, as this text is suggesting. Simple things. And it's true, isn't it? If I think of the UK, in the winter, we might all be sitting with t-shirts on and the central heating at maximum power, when actually things like that are really not very useful. Uh, you know, and then we look at the planet and wonder why there are problems, and it's simple things like that. However, I am still a teacher, and so for example, I could do a lesson like this about saving the planet by doing little things, and all of my students are nodding at me going, yes, 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 that's a very good idea, Dave, and they all agree with me. Uh, twice a week, I have playground duty, okay, so I have to look at the playground, and my playground at my school looks something like this. After five minutes, my students have taken all of their Coca-Cola cans, thrown them on the floor, taken off their biscuit wrappers, and just left them lying about. In other words, and this is like a philosophical digression, I think as a teacher, often what we do is we do try and get our students to pay attention to us, and they don't. And there is the famous expression, yeah, you can lead a horse to water, but you can't make it drink. That's true for life skills. So if we teach life skills in class, we can teach these very worthy things, maybe they pay no attention to us. When we teach the present perfect, the same thing happens, yeah? We can teach the present perfect, but we can't be sure that they're going to learn it. But actually, there is the positive side to this, which is uh, a book that I read very recently. Uh, this is Tony Little, who is in fact the headmaster at Eton, a uh, very elite school, but it's actually a very sensible book. As he says there, okay, and I think this, is, this helps me to feel less bad about my job. At its simplest, schools give young people a place at the water's edge. A horse may not choose to drink if it is led to water, but it cannot drink at all if the water is not there. So I think that's self-explanatory. Yeah? The idea is that if we don't try to teach life skills, if we don't try to teach the present perfect, nobody else will. Our job is to try yeah? and hope that students will learn something and most of them will learn something and do something about it. Okay? So philosophical digression. Next question. How many kilometers has the average item of food traveled to get to a UK supermarket? So how many kilometers? 800. 800? Any more than 800? It's like an auction. Any higher? How many? It's actually 1,600 kilometers. Okay. Uh, again, this is looking at the environment, thinking about the environment. And the whole question again, which is an interesting question about food miles. Okay. So do we realize how far things are coming? to get to us. This is an amazing packet of hazelnuts. This is a, a true packet of hazelnuts. It's amazing, isn't it? It's the product of Turkey, but it was actually packaged in Thailand before it was then shipped to the UK, which is quite amazing. There must be a good reason, maybe, okay? But I'm not sure what it is. One thing about food miles, and this is an important point about teaching life skills, is that usually there is a for and against, okay? So there is a question of food miles. Maybe it's better in the end to fly 1,600 kilometers apples out of season than to keep them in cold storage in the UK for, for the whole of the year. It also uses electricity. And I think one thing here again is this idea of critical thinking. And when we teach life skills, maybe we need to remember not always to insist that there is a right or wrong answer. Okay? Maybe the question is getting students to think more than anything. Uh, this is from the Daily Mail, okay? and this is the famous pizza. I don't know if you ever read this in the news. It came with 35 ingredients from 60 countries around the world. And people started to investigate these pizzas because of the famous horse meat scandal. The point again would be that teenagers living in the 21st century need to know about these things and to be thinking about these things because strange things happen nowadays that maybe didn't happen 50 years ago. Okay? So getting students just to be aware of these elements. Um, this is an interesting one. In the US, what percentage of cases has a company decided not to give somebody a job after looking at their social networking profile? Any ideas? So this is the company, you've applied for a job, a young person has applied for a job, and the company thinks, right, let's look at their Facebook page, let's look at their Twitter account. How many percentage? It's actually an amazing 43%, okay? 43% then of people, when they were investigated, didn't get the job because of their online profile. So this is looking at uh, information communication technology. We always say that teenagers are digital natives. Maybe they are, but they are also teenagers. So teenagers do strange things on the internet that afterwards, and this is becoming more of an issue, that will stay on the internet maybe for a long time, um, and they just were not aware. 
Um, so getting students to think about the positive and the negative sides of a social networking profile. Because in fact, many people did in fact get a job. They secured a job because they had a very positive uh, online profile. Um, this is a true story, okay? This is from 2007. If you look at this email, this uh, young person, Kevin, okay, it's October the 31st, which is significant. He sends an email to his bosses. Paul, Jill, I just wanted to let you know that I will not be able to come into work tomorrow. Something came up at home, okay? Uh, I've got to go to New York. I apologize for the delayed notice. Now, obviously, Paul and Jill imagined that there was some serious problem in the family for Kevin to go to New York on October the 31st. What happens on October the 31st in the USA? Halloween, okay? Now, of course, Kevin is young, and so Kevin puts hit this photograph up the next day. <laughs> this is Kevin, uh, and of course, his bosses immediately saw this photograph posted online, and the boss sends a message, Kevin, thanks for letting us know. Hope everything is okay in New York. Cool wand. <laughs> and Kevin, unfortunately, lost his job the next day, okay? Rightly or wrongly, uh, the point is that people do strange things. And again, if I think of my students, they would all be capable of doing something similar to Kevin because they are young. So we need to remind them, get them to think about the dangers, the good and the bad things about social networking profiles. Right, my last question. What is the very first thing you should do at the scene of an accident like this? Does anybody know? Is anybody a first aid expert? What should you do? Somebody said nothing. Yes, because... Yes, and in fact, I never knew this, okay? This is something that I, that I learned when I was writing Gateway, because I, many people say, would check the pulse or feel if they're breathing. Um, but of course, the first thing that you should do is always check if you are in any danger. Uh, we can see that there's a broken plate, there's water here, there's a boiling pan, there's actually a knife there. And the whole point about aiding in an accident scene is that first you evaluate that if you run in, are you actually going to have an accident too? Because if you have an accident, then there is major trouble, okay? That's something that I had never thought of. Obviously, that's looking at the area of safety, well-being, and, um, you know, thinking about just the very initial stages of first aid, thinking about if you had to call an emergency service, do you know what type of questions the, the operator would ask you? Uh, these are things that, you know, that I never learned when I was at school, but maybe they are things that could be extremely useful, you know, today, tomorrow, uh, any other time in the future. And again, this is the sort of thing that when you do this on Monday morning, the students might think they might never need it, and on Wednesday, they're in a situation where something happens, okay? Let's teach them something useful instead of one direction. I have nothing against one direction, by the way, but just sort of, you get the idea. Um, uh, now, talking about first aid, one little tip if you want to incorporate life skills into your lessons is have a look on the internet for free material because lots of organizations have um, material particularly ready for school age students, which is free, because it's helping students to be aware of particular uh, material that could be useful to them in their lives. So we've got the Red Cross organization, the British Heart Foundation, the World Health Organization, and even Barclays Bank has some very good and interesting material and videos looking at the area of life skills. Um, and I just want to show you a little example, just start to show you an example of something which is on uh, the Red Cross website. This is a nice little quiz for our students they could do. You have been warned, okay? So you get your students to answer these questions. What does this sign mean? It could be A, clap here. It could be B, safety gloves must be worn, or it could be odd gloves and other lost property. The answer is? <laughs> it is actually B, yes. Uh, what does this sign mean? Do not extinguish with water. Do not light a fire. If you do, we'll put it out. Or C, bucket loads of barbecue sauce available. The answer, of course, is right now... Um, that's very easy, but then in fact the quiz does go on, so have a look at that if you like, because it is a very nice little quiz. It does actually go on to get a bit more serious about, okay, so how do we, what does a warning sign look like? What does a mandatory sign look like? What does a not allowed sign look like? Does anybody know the answers, by the way? What are the answers? Because the first part was easy, but... Does anybody know? Number one is? C. C. Number two is? 
A and number three is B. That's right. Okay, so you get students to think about that. Can you, we're all English teachers, I imagine. Can we think of any language that we could teach with this? Okay. Modal verbs of obligation. We've got a great excuse for incorporating some English as well. Must, can't, have to, mustn't. Uh, so we can do two things at the same time. And then it goes on thinking about, is it warning? Is it mandatory? Is it not allowed? And then a nice little activity for the students where they actually draw those signs uh, and then they transfer them. And we can, again, if we imagine we draw the picture and then we write a sentence with a modal verb, for example. So we're getting language, but we're also teaching something useful at the same time. Another little tip for teaching life skills is doing things wrong, okay? And students like finding your mistakes. So this is, for example, doing a mini presentation. You give the mini presentation to your class, but you do it badly. So for example, what is the matter with my first slide? You can't read it because the color. So, you know, again, students often have to do presentations sort of like in, uh, uh, in English, but in other subjects and after school, okay? So get them to think about doing a slide, make sure the color's correct. What's the matter with this one? Font, so it's got eight different font styles for no particular reason. The problem with this one? Too small. Problem with this one? Spelling, grammar, so getting the, getting the spelling and the grammar wrong. And this one? So it's good to emphasize words with bullet points and with underlining and with bold, but if when you do this, then it gets completely confusing. So bad demonstrations, and actually in Gateway Second Edition, we have videos for all of the life skills pages. And so we've got here a video of somebody doing a good presentation, somebody doing a bad presentation, so that students can clearly see how to do it well, how not to do it. Um, and again, just one other thing to think about as a tip is actually uh, the idea of getting personal responses. Like I said before, there is often no right or wrong answer. So this diamond ranking exercise is just a simple way when you give different factors, in this case it's elements that are important in a job, the students decide which is the most important for them. Is it getting a well-paid job? Is it a job that sort of allows them to meet other people? Is it a job that's outdoors, indoors? And the students rank them according to importance for themselves, which I think, again, you know, get, getting the students to react to the, the material is the important thing. Uh, and talking about jobs, um, this again, if you've ever seen this video on YouTube, it's definitely worth seeing. It is shift happens, not anything else. And it says, many of our students end up doing jobs that don't exist yet, solving problems that they don't, we don't even know exist. And this idea as well that students are not going to do one job in their lives, they might end up doing 10 to 14 different jobs, which means that we need to teach these transferable skills. And again, this is a big part of life skills, teaching things like leadership, organizational skills, listening to other people, problem solving. Those are the sort of things that students need to know today, tomorrow, and for the rest of their lives. And again, by actually teaching them, because they are young, let's teach them about these things using texts, whether they're reading texts, listening texts. And after all, maybe this I would agree with, the real object of education is to give children resources that will endure as long as life endures. The interesting thing about this quotation is it is from the 1800s, okay? And we often think that we're inventing uh, new things all the time, but maybe this is quite an old concept. Just to finish my uh, very end of the talk, um, students do need life skills. How do we know? Well, sometimes they uh, have problems answering questions like this. The world around you, six animals which live in the Arctic. It's actually a difficult question. Uh, can you think of six? This student could not, okay, so his answer was two polar bears, four seals, okay? <laughs> Almost got the maths wrong, but we'll forget the maths, okay? Again, the world around you, deserts can be hot or cold. Name a hot desert and a cold desert. This word desert is always a problem, isn't it? Apple crumble with custard is a hot desert, and jelly and ice cream is a cold desert. Draw a plant cell, identify its most important parts. <laughs> isn't that brilliant? No windows. Look how sad our plant is, okay? Define capital punishment, obviously, is when you get in trouble for not putting a capital letter at the start of the sentence. What ended in 1896? So we should all know about our history. Of course, what ended in 1896 was 1895, yes. <laughs> Safety and physical well-being is very, very important, particularly in PE, okay? So this is looking at the angle of face plant. Yeah, so watch out for that. And finally, okay, Bobby has four dimes, Amy has 30 pennies. Which child has more money? 
The answer is Bobby, which is correct. You know, we get students to reflect on their thinking. It's difficult when you're young, okay? So this little student, he got the right answer, and then he draws this picture to show his thinking. Bobby. <laughs> He's reflected, okay? He's doing his best. Um, if anybody is interested in more about life skills, I did a webinar for Macmillan uh, fairly recently, or a few months ago. If you go to Macmillan Education website, that's 30 minutes long, so a little bit, no, yes, about the same as this, but slightly different. Um, also, at the end of this session, then, I believe that if you go to the Macmillan stand and you give your details, then you get a copy of the book.